Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Legacy of Impact, the YWCA's first ever virtual event. I'm Shelley Kirk here with Erica Taylor. Very proud to be your host here today. You know, usually this time of year, we're gathering for the Legacy of Style event, that fun, fabulous event where we celebrate fashion and we support this wonderful mission here. But this year, because of so much unprecedented uncertainty and change, the YWCA made the wise decision to transition to this virtual event because we're gonna honor the programs that the YWCA has in our community to support our community and make change right here. We're gonna share the real life stories of women who have lived it. We're also gonna be honoring a person in our community who has really stepped up recently in the face of this pandemic with the first ever Legacy of Impact Award. And we're also going to be looking at the women on a mission in our community as well. So we have a lot to talk about, a lot to celebrate. But first, I want to let you know that our online auction is open until 3 o'clock this afternoon. All of the information about the auction is located under the online auction table located on the Legacy of Impact website, bidpal.net slash YWCA Legacy. Now, after our event today, we don't want you to miss anything, so after our event today, be sure to check out the auction items. There are some beautiful holiday-themed baskets, golf foursomes, jewelry, you name it, it's there. Check it out, you're gonna love it. The link can be found on the Legacy of Impact website, so be sure to check out those auction items at the conclusion of our event, so stay with us. And right now, I wanna introduce the CEO of the YWCA, Erica Taylor. Erica. This is great and new ground here for the YWCA. It is. First, thank you, Shelley, for being our co-host here today. We're really grateful for your time. And Shelley is usually a fashion model in our uh, <laughs> annual event. So this is you know, a little different having her sit on the couch with me. I'd much rather see you on the runway with a fur coat. But unfortunately, because of COVID, we had to change all of our fundraising uh, methods this year. We're not having any in-person fundraisers this year. So we decided to create something new and different, Legacy of Impact, and focus on the impact the YWCA is having in the community, um, and then also highlight some incredible women in our community and what they're doing to make an impact as well. So through this opportunity of online giving, um, an online um, event presentation, we hope you learn a lot about the YWCA. We hope that people um, feel compelled to get involved with us in any number of ways, including volunteering and donating. Um, and we're making it really easy for you to do that here today on your screen. Um, but your investment in the YWCA is truly an investment in the community. Um, you're helping to reduce homelessness. You're helping to reunify families. You're helping to provide supportive services for people who are seeking to maintain their uh, sobriety and stay employed and find permanent housing. You're really helping to do so much more than writing that check or clicking that button um, because we are really changing lives here at the YWCA. So I first want to thank you for being with us here today because this is new territory for us, as Shelley said. Um, a lot of uh, behind the scenes people went into making this happen here today. So thank you for being here because we're really excited. Well, this mission here at the YWCA is so important. I have actually seen firsthand some of the programs you all put on, and it truly is life changing. A lot has happened over the 109 years the YWCA has been in existence right here. But how has the YWCA been impacted by COVID-19? The impact of your support here today is huge. On average, we provide over 15,000 nights of safe shelter each year to keep homeless women and children off the streets. We respond to over 2,500 crisis calls each year. We provide after-school programming and mentors to help girls make better choices, improve their behaviors, improve academics, graduate from high school, in addition to offering career exploration opportunities to help them create their future. We break the generational cycle of abuse by helping children learn healthier ways to deal with anger, even when they grow up to be adults. We provide education, legal advocacy, counseling, and supportive services to survivors of domestic violence. We help women in recovery live substance-free lives through supportive housing so that they can become self-sufficient, move into permanent housing, and regain custody of their children. And you are helping us do all of that just by being here today. Well, Erica, everything you just described is truly a legacy of impact, and it is inevitable during the course of those 109 years that the YWCA has faced challenges. But tell me, 
This has got to be a big one. What, how has the YWCA faced this challenge, COVID-19? Well, you're correct. You can imagine how challenging it is to run a communal living facility in the middle of a pandemic. We've had to take extra precautions to not only ensure the safety of our clients, but also our staff. Um, our staff came to work every day. When the community shut down, our staff were here working. Um, we are an essential service. We're providing services to homeless um, individuals and their children. So we were open throughout the pandemic. So it was a struggle, um, but we're here chugging along. Um, we also, um, uh, we're mindful of what the impact on the youth in our community has been. Um, in March, the schools shut down um, and children were left with no playgrounds to play on, no recess, no um, after school activities that they were used to. And so that changed life for the kids in our community, which included also um, virtual school. And the girls in our Live Wires program were cooped up at home, unable to see their mentors, unable to come to the YWCA after school for our programming, and many of them were facing food insecurity uh, due to missing the meals that they really depended on at school. Also, the kids that were living in our shelter were cooped up in a place that was very strange and unfamiliar to them, having to do online school for the very first time. So it really was a, a difficult time for the kids in our community, and especially the kids that we serve. So we knew that we had to do something to keep providing programming to these kids, to keep them engaged, curious, and learning. And so we got together and came up with a few ideas, and what we did ended up reaching far beyond the initial um, scope that we had intended. We're really pleased with what we were able to do um, for the youth in our community and their families. So uh, we have a video to show you that features Courtney Edwards, our youth programs director, and Molly Hopf, our children's advocate in the shelter. And they're gonna tell you a little bit about what we were able to do during the COVID-19 pandemic. The Live Wires program uh, primarily is an after school program for elementary age girls in grades three through five that come here for after school programming. And we also continue our programming in middle school and high school with uh, one on one mentoring based at the schools. Uh, things have looked a lot different since March. Uh, we were proceeding along as normal, and we got a call that said no after school programs on Friday. This was a Thursday. And then that Friday came in March, and there were no longer after school programs nor school. School was canceled uh, for the rest of the semester due to the COVID um, epidemic that was hitting our area. So um, after a few weeks of um, everyone being shut down and having to reflect on you know, what's going to happen with our kids? What are we going to do with our programming? What does the future hold? Uh, next step wise, um, you know, we get into April and we sit down and brainstorm on how can we still serve these children and their families in a different way because obviously we can't be with them here in this small room and uh, the need is great. We had to figure out how to make contact with these families. So we took our permission forms and um, compiled a list of all of the students and their parents or guardians, and it took days, I, I wanna say even weeks, in order to go through the checklist and try to find working numbers um, emergency contact numbers that were able to contact a parent or a student, uh, friends of friends, neighbors. Um, it, was a, it was a big process in order to get these families on board with what we wanted to do with them. So um, we took to social media, we created a new LiveWire's Facebook page, um, emails, any, any way we could to reach out to the current families that were current, the students were currently enrolled in our programs. Um, so then the next steps were getting those families to buy into being home and accepting us coming to their homes. We know that they need help with um, the academics and their education portion. Uh, we know that their families uh, were, would be struggling with food insecurities because a lot of our students depend on free and reduced lunch as well as breakfast in the morning at school. And so um, it just became one of those, how are we gonna wrap around and support these families, um, keep contact with our students and help them be as successful as they possibly can be. Our next step was to partner with Feed Evansville and by partnering with Feed Evansville we were able to do food boxes and dairy boxes on Mondays and then on Fridays we were able to do dairy and produce boxes to take to our families. 
Feed Evansville is a grassroots initiative that was started by community leaders and volunteers to fill the gap of food security during the COVID-19 pandemic. Since March, Feed Evansville has been providing lunches, uh, groceries, food boxes, dairy and produce boxes to people in need. We've also been assisting people uh, with applications and program assistance so they continue to recover and have sustainability of their food. Feed Evansville is also reaching out to other agencies and nonprofits to fill their gaps with volunteerism, resources, Resources and funds that they could possibly need. Feed Evansville partnered with the YWCA and other agencies to assist them with the Farm to Family USDA initiative where dairy boxes and produce boxes were uh, dedicated to the Evansville area um, every week since the beginning of June. Uh, Evansville received over 6,000 boxes weekly and agencies could come on a Friday morning at Evansville Cold Storage, who's one of the Feed Evansville sponsors, and um, receive the dairy boxes and the produce boxes for their clients and their programs. Feed Evansville reached out to the YWCA early during the pandemic, understanding that 57% of the children in our school system are on free and reduced lunch, which is an indication of food insecurity. Knowing that the children were home, we knew that YWCA serves a live wires program and it was going to be important and vital to make sure that those um, young children received meals during the shutdown of school and throughout the summer months. We also um, had decided that we would put activity kits together so that we could still focus on all of the STEM lessons that we wanted to uh, complete throughout the end of the school year, as well as what we would have done during our summer programming. We also designed these kits in mind for our third through fifth graders, so we did a lot of hands-on activities uh, where they could learn how to build things along with the story that they've read. The parents could take ownership. So we had feedback from parents that said, you know, um, me and my daughter made the muffins together last night after we read the story. Or my student who was a third grader in your program absolutely loved doing this and they went out and it was a rock project and they had supplies left so they went and collected rocks, brought them back and taught it to their younger siblings and shared. So it, it was really exciting to get feedback from these parents that we really didn't have a relationship with before. Or grandparents that were raising a third grader that were unsure of how am I going to keep them busy and, and occupied and learning through this process. Uh, we also found that a lot of our students did not have the technology needed to keep up with their virtual work. Um, internet was not something that was readily available. Uh, we would show up and realize that there were nine children living with one or two adults or six children living with three adults. I mean, the situations that we really were not aware of, even having these students for long periods of time, we opened up to their worlds a lot more. So. We knew it was important that every week we keep that contact. Um, we answer questions that may not have anything to do with the Live Wires program, but we're the support system for those families. I felt like that during that time, the process of building family relationships versus just a relationship with the students, that's when it started to grow. Um, the only positive part I feel like of the whole pandemic and shutting things down was building strong relationships with our families. We are finally getting to a point in the school year of trying to get back to a little bit of normalcy. Uh, we are looking at um, late in the fall at actually having students get back into our buildings and participate in our after school programs um, in, in a newly formed way. Uh, you know, fewer students. Um, but over a longer period of time, you know, uh, we're, we're working on that. It's a work in progress. It's an exciting time. But uh, we also plan to do programming uh, with our kids that are in the virtual portion of the school. So we're looking at hopefully having students here with us for us to teach in person Monday through Thursday. And then we dedicate the uh, Friday to delivering the kits and continuation of checking on those families who are doing the virtual learning and making sure those kids still feel part of our program, even though they aren't able to be with us in person. We hope that at some point, maybe the first of the year or even um, next school year, that we're able to have all those kids back on board with our programs. When the pandemic started, we had a few families within the shelter. Uh, those families had school-aged children. Um, so the children started off going to school, obviously, and then the week before spring break, uh, they were sent home work to do because things were, COVID was still very new. They weren't sure what was going on. So, you know, they just had a week. Um, and so we completed the assignments during that week. Uh, when spring break was over the following week, it was determined that they would not be going back to school. So with that being said, the, there were packets that needed to be completed on a daily basis. Um, I would meet with the kids. We started out in Courtney's room because it gave us a lot of 
space. Um, and we were able to socially distance at that point um, and still get the work done. Um, with the moms working and having other things going on, it was my responsibility to assist the children, you know, in getting the assignments done. So that could be a relief, you know, for the parents as well. It's hard enough um, on children to not have a place to call home. So when COVID had happened, it intensified and there were so many disruptions, you know, within the lifestyle that they were used to. Therefore, as an agency and as a therapist, I had to figure out ways in which I could accommodate. Um, for each child. And for the most part, they did pretty well. As you can imagine, with school-aged kiddos, they would rather play, they would rather do other things than do their homework. So at times it was a struggle, but then I would have to use incentives of, you know, so they knew whenever they met with me, they could get a snack and they would get a drink of water, you know, to help them complete the assignment. Um, it was kind of a distraction for them, but it was also allowing us to get the work done that needed to be done. So from then, you know, we were all just counting down till school was over <laughs> because, um, you know, again, the kiddos, they, it was still important that they obviously get their education and are getting the material that the teachers are sending home, you know, and re retaining that information. So um, it was, you know, it was fun teaching them. It was fun working with them, um, but it, it was also challenging at times, but we were able to figure out what worked for each child. The YWCA has been on a mission for more than a hundred years. And for this event focused on impact, we wanted to highlight women on a mission who embody the YWCA's core values of equality, excellence, empowerment, and service. Now, this first group of incredible women on a mission work in the areas of youth and education. Amy Bonenberger, Lana Burton, Angie Richards-Cheek, Jennifer Dyson, Shannon Hart, Angie Oliver, Tanya Staup, Daniela Vidal, Patricia Weinzaffel. Hi, Mayor Lloyd Winnicky here. It's always a great pleasure to support the good work of the YWCA. I'm especially appreciative that the YW has been able to stay open during the pandemic and serve women and children of, in need. Thank you so much. It's also less than a month before Election Day. Let's remember to get out to vote. Well, today's event is made possible by generous support of our corporate sponsors. You'll see their logos pop up throughout today's program. We also want to say a special thank you to all of our virtual table captains for inviting their friends to learn more about the important work being done right here at the YWCA. And let's take a look at a list of our table captains right now. A big thank you to them. Also, don't forget to check out our online auction after today's event at bidpal.net slash YWCA Legacy. We've got some great items there for you to bid on. Now, here's a message from one of our sponsors. Hi, my name is Jola Vanover, and I work for Vectron, a center point energy company in the electric meter department. As an essential worker, my colleagues and I have continued to report to work while practicing social distancing and taking other precautions to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Thanks, Jola. We salute our employees who have continued to provide safe, reliable electric and natural gas service during the pandemic. And as women employed by Vectran, we are on a mission to ensure that we are continuously striving for a workforce that supports employees regardless of such factors as gender, race, or sexual identity, and hope that they feel empowered in the workplace. And we're proud to support Legacy of Impact and YWCA Evansville in its mission to eliminate racism and empower women. Well, certainly with COVID, we saw so many women jump into action to ensure the health and safety of our community. The women on a mission are a force for positive change in our community and in their professions. Now, this next group of our 2020 women on a mission are in healthcare. Autumn Brown, Shelby Collins, Heidi Dunaway, Becky Glines, Sister Jane McConnell, 
Gwyn Perlick, the women of the Deaconess Health System. On behalf of Ascension St. Vincent, I am proud to share our five honorees of the YWCA 2020 Women on a Mission. First, Ms. Shelby Collins, Regional Medical Group Vice President. Dr. Heidi Dunaway, Regional Chief Medical Officer. Sister Jane McConnell, Statewide Mission Formation Leader. Gwen Perlick, Chief Operating Officer. And Christine Keck, Chair of the Ascension St. Vincent Foundation Board. These women are on a mission every day to deliver our mission of healing body, mind, and spirit. Congratulations to these exceptional women and all of the outstanding women recognized this year. The impact of the YWCA can best be described by the women whose lives are changed by the programs that happen right here. Your support makes this possible. These transitions happen because you make them happen. You can donate right now by clicking on that Give Now button right there on your screen. And all of the money raised from the donations and the bids from our online auction will go toward these programs as well. So don't forget to visit our online auction after this event at bidpal.net slash YWCA Legacy. Your support is vital, Erica. That's right. The support of our community is what keeps us going for 109 years plus. Um, so we depend on it to help women move from a life of uh, maybe homelessness and addiction and poverty to confidence and self-sufficiency and sobriety. So um, every dollar makes a difference. So I want to thank you guys for being here today and making your donations. So the first client story that we're going to share with you comes from Brittany. Brittany is a current resident here at the YWCA and her story is really going to demonstrate the power of our programming. Um, Brittany really also shows us that there's so many layers to addiction, uh, poverty, homelessness, abuse, trauma, so many things can contribute to what leads to a life of addiction. And what also is evident in, in her story is that relationships play a huge part in the life of someone facing addiction. Um, the relationships influence our behavior and getting away from those negative relationships can really help produce positive outcomes. And here at the YWCA, we support that. We help support you leaving those behaviors behind and um, having more positive influences in your life. And that's what's helped Brittany. And I hope you enjoy hearing more about Brittany's story. Well, my name is Brittany and I currently reside here at the YWCA um, and the YES program. Time came when I became a teenager and I'm 14 and my peers and my big brother are um, smoking pot and that's whenever uh, I started smoking pot was at 14. Um, so um, that's all I did until I got until I was about 19 years old, and um, and I started experimenting with alcohol as well. I met a girl and we started drinking together, and I became an alcoholic. Um, and with her as well, um, I started experimenting with cocaine and methamphetamines, um, and that led me into IV using methamphetamines. Through that time, I was also in and out of jail um, because of my behavior on, on, on the alcohol. The alcohol turned me into Jekyll and Hyde. And I met a man. He also was a drug addict. Uh, and we used together a lot. And he would provide those things for me sometimes. And uh, he drank as well. Um, so that's where my, homeless, my homelessness started. From, from that time on, from 2013 until I got to this program, I was homeless. And all these relationships that I've, that I've had from, from the time when I was 19 and I told you I met a girl to, the, to this, uh, girl, this other girl I met way down the road, all, all of our relationships had a common denominator and that was drugs and the lifestyle. My peers around me and the people around me, um, I definitely dealt with violence. I was hanging out with a guy and things were consensual at first. And um, we were using, and I think something happened. He, f he flipped out, and for two hours, he, uh, he held me against my will, and he raped me and tortured me for, for two hours. Um, and then he just stopped, and he took me home. There was violence between me and my ex-wife as well. Uh, 
some violence that I perpetuated and some violence that was perpetuated against me um, in and out of the hospitals, uh, most definitely. I got beat with a cane one time, uh, and this person told me that, um, that they beat me with that cane until I was completely silent. So I was beat unconscious with the cane. I, I met my ex-wife in 2015, and we got married in 2017. Um, things were rocky, things were rough, because we both used together, and we were homeless together. In 2017, I got pregnant, and we were together at the time, um, but I got pregnant with, with a baby boy. And of course, the, our uh, relationship dis dissolved after that. Um, but I was homeless the whole time I was pregnant, and I used and I used while I was pregnant. I ended up having to go. I ended up trying to quit using, but I went down to the methadone clinic. So I had my son, September twentieth, two thousand eighteen, and CPS ended up getting involved because he had drugs in his system, and I did too as well. So my mom and my brother moved in together to help take care of him. They're going to foster him, and I went back out. I ended up getting arrested eight days after I had him on September 28th. Um, this is the start. This is the start of uh, my recovery was that, was that arrest. Once I got here to the Y, um, I, I was started talking to my mom, my brother, and um, things, uh, a routine got set up and a schedule got set up CPS. And I was able to start going and seeing my son and I was seeing him three times a week. He gets, he gets sick. And uh, and he goes to the hospital and he's got a fever and I'm thinking, man, he's been catching these fevers a lot, but hopefully they'll get it down. And they'll send him home, and they'll send him. And it's it's uh, in December, and uh, he goes to the hospital the day after Christmas. So I go up to the hospital, and they tell me that um, he contracted bacterial meningitis, which I did not know what meningitis was. I thought maybe it was just like the flu or something. And my son passed away that day in the hospital. Um, and I spent about five days with my family. Um, but if it wasn't for this program and for the why, I wouldn't have had anywhere to come back to. Um, I was able to make this place my home and, and I was going to transition with my son into, into another home. And I did that. I made this place my home. And um, if I didn't have the why, I think I would probably be dead. Because I would have went back out and not had any, and not, and not, I was, I, there was somewhere I could come and not have to worry about somebody using around me. I could come and grieve. I could come and be alone. I could come and pray. This place has really taught me how to be a woman, an adult. Really, 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 truly it has. Uh, this place has changed my life. I know that the why is temporary, but me being here for me is, is gonna be um, a permanent fixture in my life. Um, even though I might be moving away and getting my own apartment, and that's only because of the why of me being able to do that. It's just been a really phenomenal place for me. Um, and it has turned my life around. It has turned my life around from, from, from being just, just not good life into, into now I have an amazing life. Uh, and it can only get better from here. Our next group of 2020 Women on a Mission come from the business community. They are forces for positive change within their organizations and our community. Terry Hollander Albin, Kathy Boyd, Carrie Elsperman, Tricia Hollander Henning, Christine Keck, Jennifer Kissel, Gina Mays, Carol McClintock, Sarah Miller, Aaron Morrison, Carrie Raleigh, Kathy Shetland, Lori Sutton, Ellen Topper, Kendra Vanzo, Mindy Word. Lori Sutton and Gina Mays are women on a mission at Barry Global. 
Lori leads Plug In, Barry's Diversity and Inclusion Initiative, and Gina leads Onyx, Barry's employee resource group focused on African American employees. Thank you, Lori and Gina, for being the change. And thank you, YWCA, for your mission to advance women and eradicate racism. Old National is proud to partner with the YWCA in support of its mission to empower women and eliminate racism. We're also honored that four exceptional community leaders and Old National team members, Carrie Elsperman, Sarah Miller, Kathy Shetland, and Kendra Vanzo have been named YWCA Women on a Mission. A big thanks to each of them for working hard to strengthen our community and thank you to everyone here today for your strong support of the YWCA. Our next group of women on a mission have made an impact in the realm of social and racial justice. We salute these women for their commitment to making our community better for all people. Tanisha Carruthers, Amber Combs Perkins, Summer El Kadari, Mariah Hobgood, Carice Johnson, Catherine Cornbloom Zell, Ann Shoemaker McKim, Jaleesa Slade, Laura Stevens. Thank you to everyone who's already given here today, and you can still do so by clicking Give Now. We truly appreciate your support. Your support goes to our domestic violence shelter, our Yes Sober Living program, and our Live Wires program. So thank you. Uh, I'd like to introduce our next video. Our next video is going to be from Julie. Julie is going to offer another aspect of addiction um, and domestic violence. Julie grew up in a great home um, with great parents, and she also faced a life of addiction. Um, this goes to show us that it's not always the stigma of a poverty situation, homelessness, childhood trauma. Julie's story is quite different. Um, and what I will say also is that Julie went through numerous rehab programs throughout her life and none of them stuck until she got to the YWCA. I'm the product of missionary parents. I was raised in Johannesburg, South Africa most of the time. I did also live a little bit in England and a little bit in America up until I was about 22, so I went to school on all three continents. Um, I got to America for good when I was about 21 years old and um, immediately got married and was kind of happy to be out um, on my own, um, not being judged by the missionary parents, even though they weren't that bad. Um, as a child, it was difficult for me to have all those rules and to not be like the other kids. Um, I married my first husband and had my first son within about a year and a half of getting here. Right as I graduated from nursing school, I also actually got divorced from my first ex-husband. And for the first time in my life, I felt like I was able to go out and have fun. And since I didn't do that as a missionary kid, I was able to go out and um, I started drinking. I started uh, dating a lot. So I continued to date. And I remember I had this breakup once and I felt really, really sad. And my friend said, here, let me bring over a bottle of wine. And this was the first time I actually associated drinking with making me feel better. I started to get a lot worse. I noticed I started to miss work. Um, I went to my first ever detox, um, to detox from alcohol. I went to an outpatient, and there began a number of years of different detoxes, different outpatients, um, actually repeated detoxes. I wasn't successful. Sometimes I would leave detox and drink on the way home. I don't know what my problem was, I was just, I felt like I had sort of lost my way along that time. So I continued to have multiple relapses and I continued to go to rehab, continued to detox, and the one rehab I went to, somebody turned me into the nursing board as someone who is a nurse and has an alcohol problem. So in January of 2012, I was called in front of the nursing board where I uh, my nursing license was taken away from me. And after having been a nurse for um, about 15 years at that point, that was my identity. That was, I felt like that was the only thing I'd really done right in life is to get that nursing degree and to be a good nurse. And I felt like I was just nothing. Shortly thereafter, after losing my nursing license, 
the house that I purchased and that I loved, um, it was foreclosed on. So I, here I am with alcohol. I've lost my nursing license. I've lost my home. Um, I have a child who is now 17, 18 years old, and he doesn't want anything to do with me now. So I've lost that. At that time, about four years ago, I entered yet another rehab. I had a habit of meeting men in rehabs. This time I met a very charming um, fellow alcoholic and um, we immediately left the rehab together and immediately got drunk and that was, um, that was really the beginning of the downward spiral. He, he turned into somebody who became very abusive to me. I was someone who was always strong, who was able to handle my own life, but I was so dependent upon him because he brought home the money that I tolerated his abuse. He, um, it was emotional abuse, psychological abuse. There was physical abuse as well. Um, I was put in the hospital a couple times by him, um, but I kept going back to him, which I said I would never be that kind of person, but I, I once you're in it, you, you know, you can't change your mind. In the meantime, between all of this, I repeatedly, I became such a heavy bottom shelf drinker. All I drank was vodka and I would guzzle it. So I was in the hospital multiple times with alcohol poisoning. All I knew is that I had to be done. There were, there were no other options for me. And um, when they let me out, they actually gave me a gas card so I could make it down to Stepping Stone. And I did, I went straight from Bloomington Meadows to Stepping Stone where I entered their 21 day program. The reason that I really wanted to go there is I heard that they were pretty harsh and I felt like I needed a total brain reset. I had no discipline. It had been me, a bottle, and this abusive man for so many years. I didn't even know how to act anymore. Um, I, didn't, I didn't know how to do anything without being drunk or passed out. And Stepping Stone, I really kind of hated it there, but they did exactly what I wanted them to do. They, um, it was from early morning to late at night, just pounding stuff into my head. And I started developing some, a little bit of discipline there. And I don't even know how much I really learned there, but I know that I got myself back into a routine. I really, really, really don't ever want to go back to, to drinking. I'm, absolutely terrified to think of drinking again. Um, I, I will lose everything and lose it immediately. I would guess within two days I'd probably land up in the ER. I, I know this. I know that I cannot take one drink. I, I mean, I know um, beyond a shadow of a doubt. And I think that was the problem before. I always kidded myself that I could cut down. And um, so now I'm living on my own in an apartment. I'm still working at TJ Maxx. It's been two years and two months and I'm getting ready to start the nurse refresher course, which I intend to get through as quickly as I can so that I can start nursing again. I also want to um, say that my case manager, Deborah, was absolutely amazing in helping me work with the nursing program. She sent all my drug tests to them, all my breathalyzers. She coordinated things with them. Um, she, she really, really helped me, and I couldn't have done it without her. I couldn't have navigated my way through the nursing program without her. While I've been at the YWCA, I've been able to slowly but surely begin to mend my relationship with my family. At first, they were very nervous, you know, what is different this time? I can't really tell you what is different this time. All I know is that something changed, and last year I was actually able to go to England to visit my mother and father and um, I was able to go to my son's wedding and just this past weekend I was able to go to my son and daughter-in-law's baby shower so um, this is really great I've also started talking to my other siblings um, they're very excited for my nursing license to be back and I think they're all starting to realize that this isn't just a fluke this will keep going on. I'm never at the point that I will just say never because you can't predict anything in life. However, I know that if today I do what I know to do, that today I will not drink. And that's all I can do.
This last group of women on a mission come from our government and public service sector. Whether they wear a robe in the name of justice or represent the people in local government, these women help create a more just community. Vanita Becker, Allison Shelby, Stephanie Terry, the women serving on the bench in Vandenberg and Warwick counties. This year, the more than 6,500 women who work at Deaconess are on a mission, a mission to help our community, to keep you safe, to keep you informed, to treat you with compassionate care, all while caring for themselves and their families, all for you. The YWCA is having profound impact on our community through powerful programming, and it only happens through generous support of people like you. We hope that you've been moved by these stories that you've just heard of hope and independence and resilience. And although we're celebrating the impact of the YWCA today, we're also celebrating the impact of others. That's right. With our first virtual event focused on impact, we decided that we wanted to focus on one special woman who has been making a major impact in our community. She not only is a super volunteer in her everyday life, she has taken volunteerism to new heights. Many of you may know that we face a food insecurity problem here in Evansville, and it was only exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Lisa Vaughn, the super volunteer I'm referring to, she took it and ran with it. When the community shut down, she sprung into action, and you're gonna hear all about it. Well, through my civic leadership uh, development, I've learned a lot about food security, but more importantly, as a child, there was moments throughout my life where food security was an issue. I can remember when my mother's car would break down and we would have to have eggs for the entire week, or when my mom had to work really late, there would be seven cans of SpaghettiOs with a can opener, and we would have to eat the SpaghettiOs with our fork. We never f went, felt like we went hungry, but there was always a wondering what we were going to have the next day. So food insecurity has become a major issue within the Evansville area. We're ranked number six in working class poverty, and 90% of the children that live in our promise zone are on free and reduced lunch. And throughout this pandemic, I've witnessed children happy just because they got their very own meal. Um, elderly women scared to go to the store eating peanut butter and crackers for two weeks. A mother calling me desperately asking me for groceries because she hasn't eaten a day and a half just to ensure that her own children would receive a meal. So being a part of Feed Evansville was important to me because I want to make sure that all people know that there's someone out there that cares about them and in a world such as our city and a world of today, no one needs to go hungry. Feed Evansville is enormously important for our community. When, when the pandemic really took hold, uh, we quickly identified gaps in services to our community. Uh, all of a sudden when schools were out and parents were not able to be with their kids as they normally would be, there was this huge gap of, okay, how do we get people fed? And literally there were hundreds if not thousands of children and families scratching their heads uh, trying to figure out how to get food on the table. Maybe it was because school was out and their kids ate at school and, and they, they didn't have that as a resource. Or maybe uh, parents all of a sudden for the first time were furloughed or were just out of a job forever and had no income. And uh, we know that a lot of these families were, were facing these kind of tribulations for the first time. So collectively, uh, a group of f folks got together and figured out, man, there's a huge gap. And Lisa Vaughn was one of those people at the table who said, hey, this is a big gap, we gotta figure it out. Um, and I think one of the beautiful things about Lisa's work is, not only was she at the table and said, hey, we gotta figure this out, but I'm gonna be part of the solution. I wanna be part of the solution. And as a mayor, to know we have residents in our city who will help identify needs, but then jump in and help solve the needs, that makes my job and the, it makes our community so much more vibrant to know we have people who are willing to step up and just give of themselves to help fill a very important need. Serving our students and our families this summer, 
uh, one of the biggest parts to be able to support them and to uh, fill some of the needs that the parents said that they needed um, help with was to bring food to those families. So being um, in a collaboration with Feed Evansville was a huge part of the success of us being able to serve our students and families throughout the summer. And um, Lisa Vaughn is Feed Evansville. She is a huge part of that collaboration. Um, she's very uh, motivational. She's very energetic and very passionate about serving the community. And so um, even though I've known Lisa for years, I got to work much closer with Lisa this summer and she was 100% in support of whatever needs we needed to help our families. Uh, she would make sure that they prepared however many food boxes our families requested on Mondays. She would make sure they saved back um, the extra dairy or produce that we asked to partner with that. Um, we would talk every um, Wednesday or Thursday evening about what support we could do on Friday as far as a pickup for produce goods and for um, different dairy boxes that we weren't giving out on Mondays in order to make sure our kids had plenty of milk, they had cheese, they had other dairy products, as well as fresh fruits and vegetables in their households. Um, she was just like the whole inspiration, motivating volunteers to be there on site to help out, um, being excited, making sure that we had what we needed. I, I can't say enough about what Lisa's passion was to make Feed Evansville successful, which in turn helped to make our programs and supporting our families successful throughout the summer. Lisa Vaughn is a true community champion. She's given of her time, her talent, and her treasures to make sure that the residents of Evansville had everything that they need, even in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, there are not enough nice things that I could say about Lisa and just her energy and everything that she's um, really shown and the light she's been, uh, not only to the residents uh, who have been volunteering, but those who are receiving the services that uh, Lisa has been the spawn of. Um, it has been so much to the residents in the city and you know, working with community organizations, everyone says the same thing. When does Lisa have time to sleep? That means so much because it shows that, uh, you, Lisa, you've given all that you had to make sure that the residents of Evansville and those who are less fortunate and those who just need an extra hand um, have exactly what they need, even in the middle of a pandemic. Um, so very grateful to call you a friend and so very grateful to work alongside you with Feed Evansville. Lisa Vaughn has selflessly given her time, leadership, and collaboration skills to the Feed Evansville initiative to ensure that local women and their families can put food on their tables. She is truly a woman on a mission, and I'm honored to be here today to present Lisa Vaughn with the 2020 Legacy of Impact Award. So Lisa, I have this award for you, as well as something she doesn't know is coming. She spotted one of our staff members wearing this t-shirt and she said, hey, I want one. So we're giving you a t-shirt too. So Lisa, congratulations. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I'd first like to thank the YWCA for their tireless efforts in helping fight racism, empower women, and fight for justice across the entire country. I am honored that an organization such as the YWCA um, has held me in such regard. I'd like to thank the volunteers that continuously provide support and their heart and passion to feed Evansville so that no one in our great tri-state has to go hungry. People will often ask me why. Why did I decide to do this? Well, I know what it's like to feel like you're useless. I know what it feels like to lose your hope or to be treated like you don't matter. No one needs to feel that way, especially in today's world. When we all can come together, we can fight what poverty truly is. It's not a sense of loss of material things. It's a sense of loss of your dreams, of your hope, and knowing that there's someone out there that loves you. In our great community of Evansville, we pull together and we help one another. And if we can help people feel that hope is still there by giving them a bag of potatoes or some apples. Why wouldn't we do that? So thank you for coming together. And remember, we're all in this together. And we're going to continue to feed Evansville and support one another. And we're going to come out better on the other side.
Wow, Erica, what an event this has been. For the first virtual event, Legacy of Impact, what, uh, this has just been wonderful. And it makes me, it, it, it's a lot to get through, but I tell you what, coming at the end of this, I just feel so proud that we have a community that supports the YWCA, the women on a mission. They are so inspiring. Congratulations to all of them. And Lisa Vaughn, I mean, you don't get more inspiring than Lisa Vaughn. Absolutely. I'm thrilled that we were able to do this. Of course, I would have loved to see you on the runway again this year. <laughs> She'll be back, folks, next year, uh, 2021. Um, but this was incredible. Thank you to everyone who supported us here today, who donated for the weeks leading up to this event, our sponsors. Thank you so much. Our table captains. Table captains are always the key to our events, whether it's in person or online. We thank you for bringing your friends to learn more about the YWCA. We could not do that without you. I also want to give a huge thank you to the YWCA staff and board of directors who helped make this possible today. A lot goes into the behind the scenes to put on something like this. And we were in good hands with Troy from Vopo Video. We could not have done it without Mr. Troy. So please, please check him out if you need an online event on my fellow nonprofit people, we're all doing it. So thank you to all of you who helped make this a huge success here today. Um, and also, don't forget to check out the auction. I'm telling you, That's there's right. some really cool stuff on that auction. It closes at 3 o'clock today. As soon as you finish here today, check out the auction. It's at bidpal.net forward slash YWCA legacy, and you can help that way. So I think I think we've done it. Yes, and don't forget the mission continues here. So all of your donations goes to keep this mission going, to keep our community strong, even in the midst of a pandemic. Even even during COVID. Thank you all so much. And thank you, Shelly. My Appreciate pleasure. Appreciate your help thank today. Thank you all. Thank you for all you do. Bye, everyone. Bye. Vopel Video is proud to partner with the YWCA for this year's Legacy of Impact virtual event. I hope you learned as much as I did about the wonderful programs the YWCA provides. The need is great. Helping those who suffer from domestic violence, substance abuse, homelessness, even food insecurity, the YWCA makes an impact every day. And these programs are successful because of support from our community. Remember, take a look at those terrific auction items, and you can always make a donation by pressing Give Now. Thanks again for watching.